Envon Environment's uh, in, uh, based in Lismore. We operate between uh, the co uh, between Coffs Harbour and up to the border near the Tweed. And um, I'm also the Vice President of the Big Scrub Landcare Group, so I'm wearing two hats today. Look, uh, the Big Scrub Landcare Group was formed in 1992. It's not your usual sort of uh, landcare group. We don't have working bees on weekends and cups of teas after our day's work. We um, set, out, set about in the early days of just getting education about the Big Scrub rainforest and what it was. And so in the early times, we set out a couple of publications. Uh, the uh, Restoration Manual gave information about uh, bush regeneration techniques, natural regeneration techniques, and also about replanting. We also put out a weed manual with colour photos and, and, and all the latest uh, regeneration techniques to remove those weeds. Every year we run uh, lots of uh, field days, about four to six um, every year. And along the way as well, we've actually um, been involved with getting um, the, the actual big lowland subtropical rainforest listed. Listed as endangered uh, ecological community on a state level and on a federal level we had it listed also as a critically endangered. So that's uh, you know all happened for a lot of volunteer work through the Big Scrub Landcare Group and Envite. And most importantly, uh, we've raised over $2 million that's gone directly into on-ground restoration activities. I'll speak about that in later. Now, just to sort of familiarise yourself with where the hell the Big Scrub is, so this little outline here encompasses what's called Big Scrub Rainforest. Uh, it doesn't include the sort of northern areas or the southern areas of that, although rain, lowland rainforest does occur both north and south of that area. It was said to be the largest continuous uh, stand of subtropical rainforest in Australia. It consists of 75,000 hectares. Uh, by 1842, no white person had entered the Big Scrub. By 1862, no white person had ever dug its soil. And yet by uh, 1900, it was all but gone, burnt to the ground, its ashes washed into the deep red volcanic soil. It's, um, and they left about 0.1%, basically, of the 75,000 hectares that was there. The reason that was, the early settlers that came in 1862 uh, were allowed to clear what was called um, free selection before survey. It was a great government initiative. That was you could clear as much as you liked and it was yours. And it worked famously. They did exactly that. Harry Frith from the CSIRO, Division of Wildlife and Research, said in a report in the 1970s about the Big Scrub destruction, there have been few more rapid and complete ecological disasters in Australia's long history of thoughtless destruction of its natural resources. That pretty well sort of sum, sums it up, really. Looking at those boundaries, um, sorry about that, the Byron Bay is up here. It's not, that's not included in the, in the Big Scrub Zone. It goes up to the sort of Nightcap uh, National Park up the top, uh, into the Western Zone. Lismore is right on the fringe. This is the uh, Ballina over here, so it's inland from Ballina. So all this area here, the sort of the eastern escarpment, if you go over the Pacific Highway towards the Tweed or Brisbane, uh, you're travelling right on the edge of the Big Scrub Zone. And down the south here, it's bordered off because of the plateau, the, the volcanic uh, soils, of, the soils of the plateau drop off to Tucky and Swamp and down into coastal heath and, and other vegetation types. So what's been uh, achieved? Um, what we've done is we've formed a lot of relationships. We work with 12 institutional partners, uh, including every uh, city council that's in the area, Lismore, Ballina, Byron Shire. We've also moved in outside of the Big Scrub into just lo general lowland. We work with Tweed Shire Council and be at the uh, Clarence Valley Council as well. We work with the local water authority that supplies water to the whole district, R Rouse Water, it looks after its catchments, and also the National Parks and Wildlife Service. We also work with uh, 60 landowners on 90 different properties and over 100 uh, different replanting sites. So in the regeneration area, we've managed to, um, oh, with the, we've had $2 million. Um, most of that money's come from uh, various sources, but the, our, the biggest supporter has been the New South Wales Environmental Trust. We're at the moment just starting on our 10th project with them and their restoration rehabilitation program and we're in the process of writing an 11th application. Hopefully we can be successful. But we've also received money from the Caring for Country program, uh, from the Greater Eastern Rangers Initiative, and the Ball and Trust, and also a little bit of money in the early days came from the Catchment Management Authority. But most significantly, we've, got, we've been working on about 87% of what's left of the 68 uh, rainforest remnants, covering an area of um, approximately about 300 hectares under active management. 
So we've got about 31 remnants that are actually at the care and maintenance stage. So we've done all the primary work, we've done all the sort of uh, follow-up work, and then they just, just need regenerators to go there each year to do a systematic run through the program and just to make sure there's no more, more weeds coming into the system. We've also got 156 hectares that are actually still having follow-up work and uh, in this new project we've got two new sites as well we're adding which will be starting primary regeneration work. So the, um, the big problem we've got obviously like everyone uh, and I'm sure in all these sites we'll hear today we've got obviously massive weed problems. The weeds uh, hit the rainforest at every single level. At the ground level you have the uh, wandering creeper that smothers the ground, stops any native regeneration. You then have um, <coughs> shrub level that grows up to you know, six to ten feet tall. You have ochna uh, and you have all kinds of other, other weeds as well. Then you have your tree weeds uh, that grow right to the canopy, uh, camphor laurel, large leaf privet, small leaf privet. And then on top of that we've got all the vine weeds. So we have vine weeds that grow to the canopy and destroy the canopy. Uh, things like Madeira vine, uh, that's um, one of our worst weeds. Cat's claw creeper. And then you have um, middle storey vines, which also destroy all the middle storey section, which is mainly the asparagus, the two couple of different asparagus species. So at every level, the rainforest is being undermined by um, you know, tremendous sort of weed invasion. Like in all projects these days, I'm sure um, it's an essential component. The monitoring and evaluation is carried out uh, before and after shots. Uh, floristic data is collected at the beginning and the end of the project to, to measure what exactly is happening in the regeneration process. And this is sort of uh, standard across certainly most of the projects or all of the projects in northern New South Wales and I'm sure across the state. It's also a, a requirement for many funding agencies as well these days, particularly the Environmental Trust has a very stringent uh, monitoring and evaluation program. This is a site, uh, Johnson Scrub, it just uh, gives you a bit of an idea. It's, a, it's about a seven hectare remnant, it's actually a nature reserve. Douglas Johnson is uh, related to one of the original settlers, one of the original settlers who actually kept seven hectares. Um, he gave that to the National Parks in the early 80s, uh, gave it away, didn't, didn't cost them a cent. Uh, this map is just sort of showing some of the areas that we're working. This is a, a creek line here. I guess what this shows you a little bit too is just um, typically you have a macadamia plantation butted right up to it, so very little area there to expand into. Grazing property over here. Got some good little regeneration occurring here and down here is a, another remnant on uh, Douglas's place that we're still working, Tarawea we call it. And we're beginning on another remnant that's over here in the next project which hasn't been touched before. So replanting, um, not a lot of the funding that we've received has gone into the replanting. We've relied on our members to, uh, and we've got 250 members to, to put the time and effort into that. And we estimate that somewhere around about 900,000 trees have been planted over the last uh, 20 years. So close to about 250 hectares. These, the sort of plantings we do typically are mixed species. Uh, we try to have a lot of um, diversity in our species. Uh, they're planted at close spacings, about 1.8 to 2 metre spacings. We generally get canopy closure by uh, between 7 to 10 years, depending on the site. We do have some problems in frost prone sites, we do have frost in northern New South Wales and in those places we, we need to only plant a framework species of about six to eight species we can plant and then as, as they get bigger we're able to add uh, more diversity as the, as the trees go up. Over time as well in the plantations uh, we do get a lot of more diversity coming in that birds and bats are dropping seed and um, over time as well the, the larger sort of the older plantations uh, that are you know, around 30 years of age you start to see a real rainforest system existing where you've got a, a really good uh, layer of leaf litter you've got a lot of dead branches and trees that might have come down in storms and so on so you've got that real biomass happening which is what happens at a general rainforest so we've pretty well got sort of planting down pat the, the biggest problem with planting and we're lucky that our, our members have, have forked out their own money is that it's very expensive um, not only just the labour and the tree component and mulching, but in more recent times you can't plant a tree anywhere in northern New South Wales that without a tree guard because the swamp wallabies will eat your whole plantation. Uh, so you either have to fence the whole area or you have to guard pretty well 80% of your stock that you plant. <coughs> These are some uh, plantings that uh, a member has done. This is just a, a grazing uh, property that he's got. Um, their property up here, a bit of a remnant that he had on a little bit of a ridge and then he's, he's planted this spot here and um, 
a little bit of a photo later, that actually shows a neighbour, it's quite a few years later, so the, another macadamia plantation has come in and it's certainly in the last 20 years that's been a, a massive change in the landscape of the area. But you can see here the, um, the tree planting is, is taking off quite well. The area where we hope to sort of get um, some linkages occurring, and, and because of these remnants, as you would have seen in that first photo, are, are fairly scattered. Um, and there are not many of them. I mean, there's 68, but spread across that landscape, there's, there's not, they're pretty far and wide apart. So through um, the, the degraded areas that uh, eventually that regrew, some of them regrew in some regrowth rainforest, and also amongst that regrew a lot of camphor laurels. So a lot of the escarpment country is, is full of mature camphor laurel. But what we're finding is we're getting very good results working in camphor laurel. Uh, underneath there, there is some weed species which we need to remove before we start killing the camphor laurels. But there's also a lot of native recruitment happening and uh, a quite a diverse range of species. And when you, you remove the camphor laurels, the actual regeneration is just explodes. And the, and, the, and the seedlings under the camphor laurels, the rainforest seedlings that are there, are, are basically surviving in the same way they would in, in a normal rainforest. They're sitting there waiting for a big tree to come over in either dying or coming over in a big storm. And once they've given their, their chance, that bit of light, they absolutely take off. So we get a great results. Um, there's various techniques. Some people only take, uh, you know, six out of every 10 campers. Some people take the whole lot. Others are very cautious and only take a few campers at a time where there might be some good natives. But it, that, all, that all depends really on what sort of follow-up you've got coming, what sort of money you've got coming behind you to help you to follow up that work because if you know that you've got uh, commitment, financial commitment from the landowner or from a funding agency, then actually removing 100% camphor and doing the follow-up maintenance underneath that, you get tremendous re results over a very short period of time. This is a map uh, showing once again uh, the boundaries, the boundary of the big scrub. The uh, darker red spots there are the, the major remnants. You can see some big ones up in the north and these little little patches sort of scattered around. The other um, areas there, we've got the, all these riparian zones, so that's sort of like a, a, you know, areas that we're looking at, corridors. But all these grey areas that you can see here are either camphor laurel, they're mapped as sort of being other vegetation. They're not pure rainforest. Uh, in some cases there may be some mature rainforest trees in there, but in many cases they're actually um, got a lot of camphor laurel. So you can see by working on those patches and these remnants here, we can gain between the, you know, the uh, riparian corridors and the camphor laurel corridors that there actually is some tremendous um, future in actually getting these linkages occurring across the landscape. And that's where we're putting a lot of our time and, and energy and future, what we're looking at trying to get happening. This is a typical um, camphor sort of forest. Lots of tall trees. It's, pretty well got to a stage where it's a closed canopy. You have very little sort of, um, in many cases, understory weeds, the lantana and so on can't survive because of the, um, it, it's fully shaded out. Uh, you do, depending on the area you're at, you, you can have uh, issues under there, but the process is to go through and remove those uh, understory weeds as your primary piece of work, and then start coming through and, and drilling out the camphor. As you can see there, there's, um, you go through a lot of herbicide because they're pretty close together, the camphor laurels. In some cases, they're not very big trees. Other times, you do hit very, very large uh, specimens amongst the, the landscape. But in many cases, they're smaller trees. Very easy to kill. We drill them. We, these days, uh, we use generators. We take in their little portable generators with a drill. Uh, we did try battery drills, but they run out of steam too quickly. Um, and we run around <laughs> drilling all these trees, injecting them with glyphosate. And um, within a very short period of time, they defoliate. And within over a number of years, we let them stand. We don't uh, cut them down. And over a number of years, they eventually break down. So they're still standing as uh, dead trees. So birds are still able to land in there, drop uh, seed, unfortunately, both native and exotic seed. But uh, they still act as a perch sort of branches for, uh, for at least five or 10 years before a lot of them actually collapse. This is a sort of another sort of photo after um, you know, the camphor laurels, you can sort of see a lot more light in there. These are pencil cedars and various other species that are coming out. Some of the ex existing trees um, that, are, that are coming through, there's already sort of trees that are, that are up to mid-storey level. They just explode and start to head up to, to the canopy. These other sort of trees that have been sitting there sometimes for 10 or 15 years really start to, to move through and, and cover that area to, to form a canopy. 
and then all the seedlings on the ground, the native seedlings on the ground are coming through. So as long as you can keep your maintenance up and stopping the weed species coming in, the, uh, the, the rainforest is coming back. What also can happen in these areas is that once you open up the sunlight and the warmth comes in, then lots of pioneer species. It's amazing the range of pioneer species that will start regenerating on the forest floor. Things like um, macarangas that we get up there, poison peach, uh, bleeding hearts, uh, red ash. These seeds have been in the soil for some time, you know, for probably since even when the uh, forest was originally cleared. And amazingly enough, you know, they, they, they still activated once the conditions are, are, are right there. So in a normal rainforest, those sort of pioneer species are activated when, when there's a big tree comes down in a storm or, or an old tree dies, and you immediately see that happening. That's happening in the, um, in the camphor forest. So it's, it's very encouraging for us to see that there, there is sort of hope in these stands of forest. Last slide here, Yet another colour selection. The remnants are now in, in purple. This isn't the whole of the big scrub. This is just an area around, if people might know, around federal Eureka. Um, but it gives you a bit of a picture why I put this one on. It's just give you a picture. Again, it really shows you that the, the remnants scattered, and though there's a bit of a cluster there. We have a good cluster in the Eureka zone, including uh, this one here, which is Johnson scrub. Um, but the uh, thing about that is, I guess, it gives you a bit of an idea of the landscape you've got. These are macadamia farms. In many cases, I guess, they're sort of preventing the, the remnants from expanding. But in many ways, they've created their own little corridors between the remnants. Um, so animals are able to move through that, which would have normally been in open paddocks. But uh, you can sort of see you know, a lot of these, these darker areas here. These are all the other forested areas. And there's you know, quite, an, quite a, a, an array of those across the landscape. So the possibilities of this corridor idea isn't really pie in the sky. It's quite, um, quite feasible that that it is achievable over many years if we can get that happening. I guess the, where are we going in the future is the, is the next thing. Um, we're totally reliant on, on funding at this present, and I say we've been able to, lucky enough to get $2 million funding to this point. We certainly hope um, that we can be successful in the future uh, with the funding agencies, but all those I know who probably apply for funding, it's, um, it's, it, it's a hectic sort of business to be in. It's very touch and go. You can invest a lot of time and energy and sometimes don't get any results out of it. Uh, for us, the recent biodiversity fund, uh, not, not one project in northern New South Wales got up, and at Envite and uh, Big Scrub, we devoted you know, probably three or four staff, about three or four weeks working on a proposals up there uh, without anything coming from it. So, you know, we'd like to be able to think that we could um, get some long-term funding, that, like everyone, I'm, I'm sure. There is some uh, possibilities. I guess we're looking at our, our private landowners to, to invest in uh, or to put their, their properties under voluntary conservation agreements, and some of them have already have done that. In doing so, they're able to get some small amount of funding at the very least. We know that we can just keep things ticking along. But there's a lot of talk out there about biodiversity credits and there's a lot of talk about stewardship you know, payments and so on. None of these seem to have really sort of gone, gone anywhere. No government's really committed to any of that sort of situation. And it's really important, I'm sure, for everyone here and the various sites that they work on that those sort of things are worked out. Um, we've got a lot of landowners, uh, we've got sites we can't even get onto because landowners are worried that uh, if we come on there and do work that we're somehow going to tie it up and they won't be able to do other things on their property. So there's a, a lot of conservative landowners, uh, original landowners in northern New South Wales. Um, there's a lot of people, you know, that we would engage if, if, if they knew, you know, they feel that the government is, is knocking them on the head with legislation but never giving them anything back. So there, there's always a lot of controversy over that. So I'm not really sure what the future lies with our funding, how we can keep it going. We've still got a strong group. Um, hopefully Envite and Big Scrub can continue to work together as we have been for the last 20 years. And I guess I can only end by saying that we're, we're positive about the future, but nervously positive, I guess, um, as to where, where our next dollar will come from. <laughs>